Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the May 13th uh, Mesa City Council study session. Uh, either present physically or uh, online are all of our council members I can see. Uh, the I first item on our agenda for this meeting is to discuss the agenda for our May 17th regular council meeting. So please refer to that document. Um, council, do you know if there's anything on that document right now that you would like additional information on? Vice Mayor. Um, I do have a few things uh, noted. First of all, um, is uh, item 4H on the uh, street sweeper. And I did share uh, some communication with RJ about a possible electric street sweeper. And um, he is looking into it. But what I just wanted to bring up is uh, we don't have the infrastructure to support, even if an electric was uh, a viable option. Mayor, Mayor, Vice Mayor, okay. we don't have the charging capability. I don't know if I'm right. Uh, so that's what we would have to take a look at. So as I uh, told you yesterday, I'm certainly happy to explore you know, electric vehicles. I think it's a bigger discussion. Um, specifically with regard to the sweeper, I'd kind of like to see some other folks use it before we take it on. You know, it's a, it's a big piece of equipment. I'm not sure how the, it's going to hold up in the Arizona heat, um, but it's certainly worth exploring. So uh, I think between uh, our, our fleet services staff and talking with our facilities folks, you know, if we think that's a viable option, we can look at installing some infrastructure out at our east yard. Yeah, that's great. And I, I just wanted to bring it up just to note that we need to start thinking about um, electrical infrastructure in our fleet maintenance yard or wherever you store the vehicles mm -hmm. so that we can make those decisions wherever it is smart to do that, um, to have a, an electric option. The city of Scottsdale <laughs> did acquire, uh, I think it was through a grant, a um, compact electric suite a street sweeper. I shared the information with you, and of course we can look at and see what their experience was for that option. But I just want to bring up going forward for any um, vehicle that we're replacing or adding on that we can look at electric options. I'm happy to start a conversation about that. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving that consideration. Yes, others. please. <laughs> um, also on 4I, regarding the um, outage management solution, the um, AMI, the Smart Advanced Meter Infrastructure Smart Meter Metering Initiative. And I know we talked about this during budget. My question was, could you just review again, is that at the, um, what do you call it? The, is that at the residential point or is that at the um, substations? Where, how, where do we monitor where out, outages occur? Mayor and Council Frank McRae with the Energy Resources Department. So initially the outage management system won't have the benefit of the electric smart meters. So we'll be rolling out the outage management assist system initially with just the existing types of sensors that we have on the system. So it'll be detecting outages at the substation and any type of devices that we have on the circuits and the feeders that go into the neighborhood. We will be utilizing those, but until we get the full implementation of the smart meters, we won't have the benefit of them bringing that data and information into the outage management system so we can fine tune what's going on with the outage. So is this metering system new or is it just a, re a replacement? Is that new to have it at the substation? It, 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 well, the metering won't be at the substation. There won't be any okay. new metering at the substation. The metering at the substation will play a very minor role in the outage management system. The other devices throughout the substations and throughout the distribution system will play a role. But the meters will be a new meter and we'll be replacing the 17,000 or so residential commercial meters throughout the system. Okay, you can, <laughs> sometimes I ask questions and then I open a can of words like, this is such an enormous amount of knowledge I need in order to have effective questions. So um, I guess my question is that um, the advanced um, meter infrastructure, the, the smart meter, is this new or is it replacing? 
existing? It, it, it will be replacing the existing meters. Okay. okay. And it yeah. will be part of the larger smart meter program that the city's going with both gas and water and electric. So, Mayor and Vice Mayor, so your question is about the meters. Today, the meters that we have currently installed throughout the city um, will eventually all be re changed out to the smart meters. Um, and that's Candace and uh, several of our staff have been working on that, working on identifying the vendor, the software. So that will be rolled out and we'll be talking more about that in the years to come. But that, that will take years to roll out. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's the balance of the um, opportunity for the new technology. Right now we are not connected to individual meters, right? It takes a meter reader to go out to the location to read the meter. The smart meter will allow us not only to receive the information that this um, meter reader gets today about consumption, but it will help Frank and the others also to, to know about if there's an outage. And, and now they'll be able to have a very precise um, information about where there may be an outage at a specific block, a specific home. That will have that constant feedback from that smart meter. So that's to come. We're working on that. Now, again, that's going to be, can you imagine replacing how many meters do we have, Candace, water, sewer, gas? What's the total citywide utility number? Do we know what that number is? Oh, what is that number? 200, that's about 200,000 meters. 200,000 meters that have to be replaced. So we're going to, I mean, but we're going to start. And that, that gets to your, I think maybe your question is, all of those are going to be new meters. Um, the good news is that we've replaced meters today. We're almost all. We do have water that are uh, compatible. Okay, yeah, right. So some of the water meters that we're right. placing today will be compatible. So anyway, that's where we're headed with the smart meters. Until that time, Frank will have to receive that information. At uh, He can't get that information right now with this at the homes. Once those are replaced in his service area, then that information will be Direct, will be associated directly to an address. Is that correct, Frank? Correct. And, and so the information that we'll be relying upon until then is the existing equipment and devices that we have and some new devices that we'll be installing throughout the system. They just won't be at the, the meter at the, the point of consumption on the residence or the business. Right. So I'm asking on this purchase, it's just the infrastructure. I mean, what is the first of that initiative to get to the... So at... Yeah, so Mayor and uh, Vice Mayor, this the one that's on your agenda for uh, Monday is the outage management system itself. That's the software the that software. would sit. This okay. is the software, the integrations into our existing into Frank's existing systems. So this is a the software. They're really parallel projects: the outage management system and the smart metering system. Okay. These the outage management system is coming to you first. Um, the smart metering contract we hope to bring to you uh, at the after in about August, August beginning of September. Um, so they're really parallel projects. This is really a software system and implementation um, integrations into everything that we have today so that, so that um, environment energy resources can receive that information directly, just not from the homes yet, but they can receive it from the other distribution points that they have. Okay, that makes sense to understand it from a software perspective of what, what we're purchasing. So thank you for that explanation. And then I had one last question. It's about capital improvements, and it doesn't. It's more about. Um, we had a. I thought there was a presentation um, on attached to the five-year capital improvement program, item 10B. And Mayor and Vice Mayor, we actually do have a presentation on that item. If you'd okay. like to give that. Great, thank you. I just was. I was waiting until we kind of got to that part of the agenda, but we're. Mayor, when you're ready, we can we have staff prepared to make a presentation on that. Well, thank you. I, I do note there's a couple of things on our agenda Monday, including DMA that we have a presentation on, and then the, 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 the CIP uh, program, which we have a presentation on. Council, other than those two items, any other questions about Monday night's agenda? Mr. Thompson, Mr. Luna? Okay. If that... No, Mayor, we're good. Okay. Thank you. Then, then why don't we... Uh, I, I think... The order that we have them agendized in for today's meeting is to start with the uh, DMA, but we already, well, but we already have the... Yeah, it's just, this item is on the agenda. It's not agendized separately, Mayor, the CIP, because it's on the council agenda. So, okay. that be okay. Let's go in this order, and then we'll bring DMA up, and they're going to speak to more than just the item on the agenda. They want to give a broader presentation for DMA. Sounds good. Thank you. Please proceed. 
Good morning, Mayor, Council, Brian Ritchell with the Office of Management and Budget. Alongside me, I have uh, Justin Stant, who is also with the Office of Management and Budget. So this presentation before you today kind of encapsulates and does a review of the two presentations I did uh, present to you before on April 1st and then also April 15th. This just combines it all as a recap before uh, for the agenda uh, item on Monday. So to give kind of a, a brief overview of the capital improvement program process, so the city council annually approves the five-year capital program per the city charter. And I have approves underlined because that's kind of what the council, the council gives us direction for that five-year program. It's not an adoption of the five-year program. It really, it's an approval by council to move forward with that program. As mentioned, projects and timing of projects may change from year to year in that program based on either city priorities or available funding. So projects within that program may move up, may uh, be postponed, just depending on the timing and the funding of those projects. So it's really an approval to move forward with that program. As mentioned, each year we do come back with a revised program for consideration by council. Now for the city council then will adopt just fiscal year 21-22's um, budget. So that's where this, it only adopts the budget for that fiscal year for the program. So you're not adopting 2022-23 and on, you're only really adopting the 21-22 amounts of that program. And each project in that program does come before council for consideration. So if there's another, so when each project does come forward, even though you adopt the whole, the budget for that year, each project will come forward for approval or for consideration by council. So the next slide is the, the pie charts, just to give you an idea of the fiscal year 21, 22 and kind of the percentages of each um, source of, for the one on the left. So as you, as you notice, the utility revenue bonds are a, a, a big portion of that pie. And then local revenues is the, the second largest along with general obligation bonds. And then you notice in the, 20, the five year program, the 22 to 26 utilities is a big portion. And then also the, uh, the general obligation and local revenues. And this is kind of what you've seen before, just uh, projects that, uh, uh, CIP projects that are in the 21, 22 budget, they're either continuing throughout the program or they're just starting. And so as mentioned, we've got this, the city center, uh, some library improvements, we have the historic post office, and then also Red Mountain Park expansion. And then on the public safety side, we have some fire apparatus uh, replacements, and then also uh, fire station 221. And then on the transportation side, we, we have uh, Broadway Road, uh, Sossman and Baseline, and Signal Butte, just to name a few. And then on the utility side, on water, we have the, the Central Mesa Reuse Pipeline, uh, Signal Butte, the water treatment plant expansion. And then we also have the Northwest Water Reclamation Plant, uh, major plant improvements, just to name a few for on the water resources side. And then on energy resources, for natural gas, we have the uh, Queen Creek Gate Station and then also Southern Avenue to Country Club improvements. And then on the electric side, we have some sub, substation improvements along with some electrical undergrounding. So those are the, the major projects that are in the fiscal year 21-22 proposed budget. As you see on the next slide, of the, this kind of puts the numbers to the previous slides of the pie and the projects. And then as I mentioned on Monday, the adoption is just for fiscal year 21-22, but then for the CIP approval as part of the charter, it's the whole program, which is the second column, which is the 22 through 26 CIP. I know that was kind of brief, uh, but uh, it was uh, just a brief overview of the CIP, and I'm available for questions if there are. Thank you. <clears throat> so again, th this is on our agenda for Monday as a, uh, we're having a public hearing. Uh, just on approving or introducing the CIP budget? Mayor, council, that is correct, yes. Okay. Council, any questions? Vice Mayor. I did have a question. Um, I know we have the schedule on this with all everything listed out, which is a lot of pages, a lot of pages. So <laughs> I was wondering, 
For me, do you have a total for the water projects, what that consists of? The Central Mesa reuse pipeline, which I believe was like a, around 100 million. Vice Mayor, for just this year or for the full five years? For, no, just for the 21 22 okay. CIP projects okay. on a slide seven, page seven. So it's a combination of bonds and also uh, capital. So mm -hmm. we would have to add it up for just uh, the water. So water utility bonds, it's about 146 million total for the water. So we have the bonds that are at 73.4 um, and then we have uh, some other ones up top. The wastewater and water. Yes. So down at the bottom of the schedule that's attached to the resolution, kind of the resolution also has a, a two page attachment uh, for the, that. And if we add up the wastewater and water, it's about a, about 140, 146 million dollars for both water, for water resources, wastewater and water. So we know the Central Mesa reuse pipeline, or maybe it's not ex being expended all in one year, correct. but the total. That is correct, oh, okay. Mayor, I was say uh, Vice Mayor, that is correct. So, okay. it's, so a lot of like the bigger projects will expand multiple years. We'll start it coming up in this next fiscal year, but it'll span multiple fiscal years. So we put <coughs> the budget in there, but then it'll, um, uh, it's part of the program itself. Okay. So um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but could you follow up with me? Um, the cost of those water projects alone over the total project, however many years it takes, the, maybe it's five years oh, or whatever. Any one project or? The Central Mesa Reuse Pipeline, which I know I have an estimate on that. The East Mesa Water Interconnect Pipes, which I have no idea. The Signal Butte Water Treatment Plant expect expansion I could guess um, is probably over a hundred million um, I, I don't know but just those three of like what we're spending on water infrastructure and you can follow up with me I don't mean to take the time or put you on the spot right now well and there'll be projects I'm assuming we have built in there the replacement of quarter sections that water has for doing main, you know upgrading uh, pipe throughout the city also we do. Those are the big projects. Do you just want those big projects or you want everything related to water? Those projects okay. in particular. All right. All right. I just want to make sure because that will be a subset, a big mm -hmm. portion, but there are, there are a lot of other water projects out there. Right. Okay. Yeah, the mayor, council, the list I have here on the slides is just the major projects of those. There's um, other like water lines, replacements of wastewater lines and of that, but then also like for energy resources, there's a bunch of undergrounding and things like that that are going on too. These were just the major projects. But we can get you those summaries. Oh, we can, okay, thank yep. you. Thank you, council. Any other questions regarding the CIP budget or the, uh, present, the, the hearing on Monday night? <coughs> All right, thank you very much. Mayor, I, I failed to mention to council, um, there will be an item added to the agenda Monday. Uh, if you recall, last Thursday, we had a presentation from our housing staff regarding um, additional ESG dollars that were coming to the city, and the council was um, good with the direction moving forward. Um, HUD is asking us that we take action as soon as possible to get that authorization from the council, so that $4 million in ESG CV two dollars will be added to your agenda for Monday so that we can get those approved by council. HUD's asked us to, we I think had a schedule of doing it in June and they've asked us if we could move that further ahead. They want to keep mm -hmm. moving those dollars out. So um, anyway, we're just going to add that to your agenda on Monday. So thank you. I assume that can be on the consent agenda. Yes, we'll just okay. add that on the consent. Yeah. Thank Is that you. all right with you, council, to have that given that we've already we already know a lot about that, and we're just giving the federal government permission to give us money? Yes. All right. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Council, any other questions regarding Monday's agenda? Okay. So, seeing none, we'll move to the next item on the agenda for this meeting. That's item 2A, which is to hear a presentation about the Downtown Mesa Association, the services they provide, and a vision for future services, and about the Special Improvement District assessments that fund the DMA operations. <clears throat> Nancy, have you been to these meetings before? No, well, then, I have not. <laughs> uh, it, I, I, 
everybody. I, I don't. I don't think it's she, Nancy needs an introduction. Nancy is is the head of uh, the Downtown Mace Association, along with our director of Downtown Transformation. I was <laughs> struggling on that word. Jeff McVeigh. Morning, two Mayor. Two of the busiest people in the city. Morning, Mayor Council. Again, Jeff McVeigh, Manager of Downtown Transformation. With me today is Nancy Horman, our Executive Director and President of the Downtown Mace Association. Um, on Monday, um, items 9A and 9B are public hearing and uh, approval of the annual assessment um, for the Downtown Mace Association. Um, that agenda item is specific to the assessments, but we thought it's about time that we bring DMA over here to uh, present and talk to you about what those assessments actually accomplish and what they do with them. Um, while, while Mayor's correct and most people know Nancy, I'm gonna still take a couple minutes to brag her up a little bit. Um, Nancy comes to us with 35 plus years of experience running downtown associations, starting with, you know, uh, starting the first association in California with the city of Sacramento, then moving on to San Diego, spending time in Dallas and Raleigh, North Carolina. San Francisco, not San Diego. Uh, oh, San, I did mean, it's a San. Um, San Francisco. Um, uh, before um, finishing her career in downtown Tempe um, and retiring, um, <laughs> We did lure her over to, to work with us after a leadership change at our Downtown Mace Association. And, and she was only gonna do an executive search for us. She's gonna help us find a new executive director. And, and luckily enough for us, we, we made her fall in love with Downtown Mesa. And she committed to come and work with us for, for a year, maybe a year and a half, if we can twist her arm a little bit. Um, and in that amount of time, um, the partnership between the city and DMA has become even stronger and we are accomplishing things, great things. And I wanted to give Nancy a chance to, to talk about what DMA does, what our plans are in the future and, and, and what we see long-term. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Nancy. Okay, Mayor, Vice Mayor Duff, Council Members, Mr. Brady, a pleasure to be here today. Um, and Jeff is right, I did fall in love with downtown Mesa. It's just amazing. And what's going on right now just blows me away. But what I wanted to do was kind of talk to you about, now do I just hit let me the know. button? Okay, you go, <laughs> go. Okay, is just, Talking about just the assessments and what we do is that the private property owners in 1984 voted to create this Enhanced Municipal Services District. You were the first one in Arizona and we hold it up, all of us hold it up to thank you Mesa for doing this for the first one. Uh, the private property owners pay 304,000 of it and then you as the city pay your fair share assessment for your properties in the downtown. Um, so that is, uh, there was a, a, an arrangement made with how much you were going to pay. And then on top of that, we have two other contracts with you that we're gonna talk about. And one is for parking compliance. I do not call it enforcement. It is compliance, much nicer. People won't yell at you. <laughs> um, and then cleaning the parking lots and the garages. So what we've done next, we, I came in as a consultant to look at the organization and to make sure that everything was in compliance with the EMSD statute from uh, the state. What we looked at next is that there was a strained relationship between the DMA and the organization that was set up to do uh, events, you, uh, Ultimate Imaginations, Inc., and on top of that, what I discovered is there was no partnership between any of those and the city, which is this is supposed to be a public-private partnership. It was not. So what we did next was we created a new structure which was much more inclusive for everyone to work together. And that has the UII, the DMA, and the city working together with one executive committee to oversee the whole thing. So everyone knows what everyone else is doing. We make the decisions together. And then on top of that, what we did was we took the DMA, which by state statute has to be governed by those who pay, meaning the property owners. So we split the board into next, 
two different boards. The first one was the property owners board, and that is the executive committee with the representatives from each of the other boards on that, next. And then after that, we have our downtown business owners board. And it's uh, council member Duff serves on the first one, and Jeff serves on the business, uh, property owners board, so that we have this cooperation going on at every level, and it really has worked. We have a great public-private partnership, and I'm not trying to blow smoke in anybody here, but I have worked in many cities, and I have never had a partnership like we have here at the city right now. This is amazing, and I think between all of us, we're gonna accomplish some great things. So um, the team is, uh, when I came on board, I brought in some people. What people don't understand about downtown associations is that it's an industry and a profession. It is not just, let's put on a show. So what we I did is I brought in professionals who have all, almost every one of them, worked for another downtown association. We have someone from Santa Barbara. We have someone from... Um, Chandler, and we have someone from Tempe who all now work in our downtown. And it has been great because we hit the ground running instead of having to educate them on what a business improvement district is and what it's supposed to do. So the first thing we did was we took the uh, money that you guys uh, contribute for the cleaning of the parking garages and the lots. We added the property owner assessment dollars to it and we created what was called the, the clean sweep program. I'm sure you guys, if you've been down here, see these blue uniformed people on the streets. They are cleaning all the time, every time. We, we are six days a week right now and Sundays are getting so busy that next year in our next fiscal budget, we are putting more money towards that in order to add someone on Sundays too. So it's really been very successful. And um, what we applied for some CARES Act money. As part of that, we got to buy some great equipment. At the bottom picture you see there is one of our trucks, which is branded with both the city and DMA because we are a partner. But that enabled us to take one of our clean sweep people using the money and train them as a homeless outreach coordinator. So they are able to go and talk to, not only are they out there cleaning, but they also go and help find places work with the navigators to try to put people in places to help them. So that was the first thing we did. Then we had partnerships with two different organizations, one being Evolve, which is our public relations firm, the second one being Entertainment Solutions, which is the same company that the city works with to do all of the special events. They have been wonderful in helping us to transition to have a professional event production team doing our events downtown, even though we did only small events this year, we're hoping to come out of this uh, to do some major downtown events. Um, the, the media, what you can see here is, we, this is only from December till now. We have gotten so much media exposure, and it's not just because of the team that's putting it out, it's because of what's happening in downtown Mesa right now. We are top of mind, and the best thing that's happened out of this is the press now calls us and says, what's going on? What do you have for us? We don't have to push things as, at them as hard as we used to. Right now, they're coming to us. So the next thing we did was we built a new website. Um, our website was old and antiquated and didn't really work and do much for us. So we created a new one, new things, and it is very interactive. The first things I'm gonna talk about is all the partnership we have for this website. On our dining guide, we are now linked with a new program that the Economic Development Department is doing to promote dining and shopping downtown, and their landing page for all of their um, promotions are our website. So it's a wonderful connection there. The other thing is the 
Uh, uh, every merchant downtown gets its own page on our website. That page and that listing is linked to the new kiosks. So all the kiosks always have all the businesses, walking bold businesses, that they can get to from that kiosk that they're looking at. And it's constantly updated because we constantly update the website. And then the, the fun thing, and you can't see it very well on here, and I encourage you to go to the website and try this, but if you were to link on one of our businesses down there, and we an example here was El Vineo, what it does is it tells you where all the nearby shopping is, where the uh, nearby restaurants are, and most importantly, where is the closest place to park, and it tells you by feet how far away these parking garages or parking lots are. And that's a real good way to get people to understand, they always think parking's so far away, you know, you're parking so much closer in a downtown than you are in a shopping center, but that's perception is reality and perception is they have to walk too far. So um, the next thing we did was a new gift card program. We had some paper, non-traceable, non-trackable gift cards that were very hard to deal with. We put in a professional gift card program. Um, over 35 of our businesses immediately signed up for it. In the first three months that we did this, um, well, it was five months altogether, we sold over $17,000 worth of gift cards, which was quad quadruple what they sold in the whole year last year. So it's very, and this is direct benefit to our merchants because this is money that you go, they go spend in the stores. And then when we opened the farmer's market, 12 of our market, uh, vendors also take the gift cards. So it's really very, it's used very much in the downtown. Um, and we did some holiday promotions. Uh, this year we couldn't, because of COVID, we didn't do a lot of special events, but we wanted to keep things active. So we, uh, first thing, when I first came on board, I did a partnership with the MAC, and they did that wonderful Ray Villathane Halloween thing with the pumpkins and all the windows. It was so successful and so exciting to watch the people walk downtown that we replicated that with a snow globe hunt and a Cupid hunt for Valentine's Valentine's Day, just to keep people to come downtown, not in big groups, socially distanced. There's things all over the sidewalks to keep them socially distanced. And it really did help also with the PR. I mean, it's just amazing with the continuation of the PR. Um, then working with Jeff's team, we had a brainstorm one day while sitting at Mary Main Street and seeing the beautiful little plaza that was there and we decided, what can we do to help our restaurants? So we created a big extension of premise for all of our restaurants downtown where they could, people could get their food, go and sit in this wonder little outdoor cafe, which extended the use for everybody as, because all of our outdoor cafes were packed, which was exciting. So we created more space for them to do that. We also created a downtown dash program, which was a golf cart that the mayor got to deliver one of our things. But you could order from any of our restaurants downtown and uh, call it in, and our golf cart would go pick it up and bring it to them. And so you could eat from any downtown restaurant in our al fresco. It was incredibly successful, and it was a partnership with the MAC, the city, everybody came together to make this happen. Um, the next thing we did was working with the parks department and they helped us do this tremendously. Uh, we did movies um, on that same plaza to bring families down. We're doing it on Saturday nights when we're filled in the bars, but we're not bringing families down for the dinner hour. So this was about bringing families down. They would eat in the restaurants, then they would come to the movie and we brought uh, princesses one week and uh, superheroes the next week. And the next movie is Harry Potter. So we'll be bringing families. And it was very successful. We sold out all of them within two days. Um, and um, the parks provided the projector, the screen, the setup. It was great. Uh, then we took the farmer's market, moved it from the park and into our district, into the fabulous location at the MAC. It's so beautiful there. Uh, we doubled the sales in the first uh, four weeks. 
Uh, people were coming. It's slowing down a little bit now because it's hot. Um, and but we are one of the only markets that goes year round. So we have picked up more for more farmers because they left the other markets to come to us. So we're excited. We are no longer. We started out as a farmer market, but now we are a farmers market. <laughs> okay. So our goals now for the next year to continue to do what we've been doing. But on top of that, we have noticed that during COVID, there's a new thing that has happened in our downtown is because of our empty streets, we were kind of taken over a little bit by a lot more homeless than we ever saw before. We've seen a lot of vandalism in the last couple of months. We've even had homeless people walking down the sidewalks and taking food off of people's plates in the outdoor cafes. So it's a new thing for downtown, Temp downtown Mesa. Downtown Tempe has been experiencing this for a very long time. But coming from downtown San Francisco, we don't have a big homeless problem. It's all relative, but perception is reality. So what we've done is we've put in an application to try to create a downtown engagement officer program. It's an ambassador. They're out there. They're trained for the homeless. They are there to make people feel comfortable, not uncomfortable. If someone is panhandling them, they feel good about not giving them money and giving them some sort of, we give them information, where to get help, what do you do? How can we help versus how do we just perpetuate this? So we felt that in order to change that perception, we needed to create a new reality. So we are hoping in the next budget year to launch this program. The next thing that we, um, the DMA is contracted to run the parking permit program and the parking compliance program. And during COVID, another, it was incredibly, and I will admit, neglected. The program is a little bit of a mess right now. And I think one of the reasons is because it was not professionally managed. It was, there's now four databases we have to go to in order to put information in. We have people who are asking, have one parking permit and said they have uh, other cars. So some people have as many as eight permits for one car. We really are hoping in the next budget year to pull all the permits back in, start over again, doing it with possibly hang tags. So if you have more than one car, you take your hang tag out and put it in your other car. We don't need to give everybody permits for all of that. But we need to look at getting a professional management system with professional software to run a program. We are not here to do things half-assed anymore. We want to do things professionally. And then the next thing we need to do is after five years, you always have to renew the district. When renew looking at the district, I have created 22 districts across Arizona and California. And what I can tell you is our assessment methodology after being done in 1984 is no longer relevant in this downtown. The buildings aren't the same. The services are not the same. And a lot of people are paying more than their fair share. And a lot of people are paying less than their fair share. So instead of just renewing the district as it is, we are going to go out to the, the rate payer community. We're going to ask them, what do they want if they live in the best of all possible worlds? But out of that, what are they willing to pay for. And then we need to design a fair and equitable assessment methodology to bring the right type of funds to downtown. I've worked in a lot of downtowns. This is one of, besides Dallas and San Francisco, but one of the biggest downtowns. We have one of the smallest budgets I've ever seen in a downtown organization. And we can accomplish so much more, but we need to figure out how we can get those funds and what kind of partnerships we can come up with in order to create more synergy in our downtown and do more programs. So that will be done and will be coming to council with that hopefully in the next budget year. 
And then um, our goals are to do events, but we've put together a team of our downtown businesses who are working with us to design a new signature event for downtown. And we didn't want to design it. We wanted the people who need to benefit from this to work with us to design it. So we're talking to them about what works for you in, event, in an event, what doesn't work for you in an event, how do we make this work for you? So I always ask them to put on their community hat and then take that off and put their selfish hat on too. Because if it doesn't work for them selfishly too, they're not going to want to do it, and it's not going to be successful. So we will be putting that in as well as continually to do some things, but we're going to open slowly as we come here. So we're going to still be doing a lot of promotional events to keep the activities going downtown. Uh, our public relations, we now, as we open up, we want to start doing broker briefings, bringing brokers down here, showing them what's going on, trying to attract more retail down here, bringing media tours down, and getting people to visit us. And of course, we need to continually professionalize the DMA to get it out of a non-professional organization into something that is going to work for all of us to make downtown even better. Um, we, I will be at the end of this year conducting a search for your permanent executive director, uh, but we are working on a secession plan right now to make sure that it's smooth, that we never go through what we're going through right now. Our biggest thing that we say in our office every day is we don't know what we don't know. So what we want to do is figure out what we don't know and then move smoothly on after that. Um, that's where we are right now. And um, any questions? <clears throat> Thank you. Wonderful uh, and inspiring presentation, Nancy. We're, we're so glad you're here. And um, Downtown Mesa is a wonderful story. I, 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 I wish uh, the, yesterday I was at lunch at, at downtown and I, I kept thinking, I wish I could go to multiple lunches a day in downtown Mesa. <laughs> There's just so much good here to see. So uh, I'll kick it off by just saying, I, to me, it seems like downtown Mesa, we, we, sadly, we used to talk about the, uh, the uh, potential of downtown Mesa. We don't talk about potential anymore because it's been realized and, and, it, and it's just fun to see be caught up in the enthusiasm of what's happening. Uh, I think downtown Mesa has now become a point of pride for everybody, no matter where they live in the city. We used to have some people say, well, why would I care about downtown? I never go downtown. Those, those people, that, that's not the issue anymore. I think everyone uh, considers downtown Mesa their living room. This is where they want to bring their, their relatives when they come in from out of town. Um, so it, it, it's fun to see that happen. And, and, uh, and clearly, DMA needs to be much more than it has been. And so I, I, I certainly endorse what you're doing and, and the idea that, that we're going to, that you're going to leave it better than you found it. So, so thank you so much. Obviously, there are some, some significant challenges, and, and you've identified those. Uh, we need to, you know, par we, we've aspired to have a parking problem in downtown Mesa for a long time now, and, it, and it's you, happening. You're having one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so thank you for bringing a professional approach to that, and, and we do need to figure that out, obviously. Homelessness. Uh, as in every downtown, is certainly uh, in increasing. I, I love your approach. Uh, when we see that happening, the, the question is, what can we do to help? Uh, which, you know, not how do we get this person out of here as fast as possible, but uh, the solution is what can we do to help that person, uh, and, and that will help everyone when we do that. So uh, I, I certainly endorse what, what, what your, your presentation, very appreciative for, for what you and Jeff are doing in our downtown and uh, anxious to see you be successful. So the, the, the item that's on our agenda for Monday is just our regular uh, assessment hearing. Right. Uh, and the, the, as I understand it, the, the strategy is uh, status quo for this year. Yes. And then we'll come back next year and propose some more significant changes to to scale it to where it needs right. to be. We didn't feel it was an appropriate time to ask people to pay more money. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Vice Mayor, I know you've got... Of course I have <laughs> a lot to say. Yeah. Downtown is literally my living room. I live just a couple of blocks away and been so passionate about it for and one of the um, primary reasons I ran for council is to see its development off. But I love your statement at the beginning of the presentation said a new energy for a new economy. 
And um, from where we were a year or two ago before Nancy came on, it is night and day. And I cannot say thank you enough and thank our lucky stars to have you come in and turn over this downtown to catch up to where we are in our development and really launch downtown Mesa as a destination. And you have done that in, in so many things in a short amount of time. I appreciate everything you. that you have done. And I appreciate the partnership also with uh, Jeff. It's, it's, the downtown it's not just me. When you're talking right. to me, you're talking to him too. There's a whole team <laughs> going on here. And between the two of you, you have really remarkably um, launch downtown, like I said, so I can't say a thank you enough. Um, I do want to ask uh, for the benefit of uh, everybody who may not be as familiar with the Downtown Mesa Association, that your boundaries of the territory in which you take care of, so that we're all aware of that. The boundaries are University to Broadway, from Mesa to Country Club. We are one square mile, but most of this is done in, in zones. So the major zone in our assessment district is Main Street, and then it goes down from there. Great, great. I don't have a lot of questions. I appreciate being on the board and the work of the entire team. Thank you. Thank you. Council, other questions for these folks? All right. Well, again, thank you so much. We're happy to be part of your team. I look forward to working with it closely going forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda is item 2B. This is to hear an update from the city manager on employee compensation, focusing on fire personnel and budget impacts, and provide direction for the city's 21-22 budget. Mr. Brady. Thank you, Mayor. I have uh, Candace and Mike come on up, help me out. Um, Council, I want to just bring you up to speed on um, the development of the um, budget for this year um, and just kind of some co com components that we've been working on that I want to bring you up to date, specifically as it relates to compensation for um, firefighters. Um, and to do that, I want to get, just step back a little bit, back to January of 2021. Um, if you recall, we obviously were still in the pandemic, we had um, typically, well, we would say normally in a typical uh, budget year, the city would uh, budget and allocate um, uh, pay raises for employees that usually uh, effectively take place on the first pay period in July. But um, in that time period, obviously, we were still in the middle of the pandemic. We weren't certain about the city's finances. So we suspended the increase in pay back in July of 2020. However, uh, as we made it through the summer and we're heading into the fall, we recognized that the city's financial position um, was doing much better than we anticipated. So when we, um, we made the decision then in January for the January 2021 calendar year, the beginning of that, we did a, a multiple things to address um, employee pay and make sure we were staying competitive. But the first thing that we did um, is we made an adjustment to the range of um, pay, and specifically we'll talk about firefighters today, um, that we adjusted that range by 5%. So it meant that the beginning salary was adjusted up 5% as well as the maximum salary for that position was adjusted up by 5% uh, beginning in January of 2021. And then what we, um, what we did is that we made the decision to also implement what we had suspended in, from July, the 3% step pay. So that was put in place. Now the order of that was very important. It was important for us to first adjust the pay ranges up by 5%. And one of the reasons before we implemented the step pay, we did that with specific intention because we, at the time we had let's say about 40% of our firefighters who were at the top of the range. They were making the maximum amount within that range. So when we made the adjustment in January to increase that range by 5%, we did that first and then implemented the 3% step pay that had been scheduled in July. What that allowed then is for every firefighter to receive the 3% step pay 
back in January of 2021. So that's the first thing we did. We also recognized that we had um, the impact of the, of the pandemic on the city's finances hadn't been as significant as we anticipated. So we wanted to also co kind of look back to say, uh, employees had not received that 3% increase uh, back in July. And so we wanted to figure out a way to, um, what's the right word? Um, compensate. compensate them for that period of time. So what we did in order to simplify it, we came up with an amount which was a, a little more than about a 3%. Uh, so then in January, we also uh, provided a $2,000 non-recurring compensation to all firefighters. So that was an important milestone for us as far as compensation for uh, firefighters and, and all employees, but certainly by adjusting the ranges by 5%, providing for the 3% step pay, but now by doing the increase in the ranges allowed all employees, even those who had been sitting at the maximum pay to receive a 3%. And uh, by the way, they'll receive the other 2% this coming July. And then we also, uh, for those that are at the top of the range, but we also provide the $2,000 check, which for the average um, firefighter was equivalent to a little bit more than actually 3%. So that's what we did back in January of this year. So we, um, we, we tried to address that. After we made that adjustment, in our discussions with our local uh, fire union president, um, he indicated a concern that there were a group of um, firefighters, um, and we'll just refer to them as the uh, kind of the middle of the tenure of the firefighters, uh, in specifically in years with six to 10 years of experience, that as they looked at them compared to um, firefighters in other cities, namely uh, and specifically Chandler, the difference between the pay that was being uh, given to a firefighter in Mesa at, at year six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 was less than what someone in Chandler would be making for that same uh, tenure. So we had, um, we looked at that and over some time and after trying to understand specifically um, what that gap was, um, we've also worked very hard to try to figure out how to identify that need. Now, let me be care clear and you'll see in the presentation later, um, a Mesa firefighter who is at the bottom of the range, who is just starting out for the first three or four years, actually makes more than almost, almost any other firefighter in the Valley because our, our minimum is so high. After about 10 years, um, our firefighters, because our range is so high on the max, also um, make more. And we will have about 20% of our firefighters at the end of, sorry, at the in beginning in July of this year, will be at the top of the range, meaning they will be making, 20% of our firefighters will be making more than any other firefighter, almost any other firefighter in the Valley. So I think we've tried to be competitive, but we also wanted to hear it in con the concerns that were expressed to us. So we have provided a five-year deal. So on slide three, you see the first two years that are being presented. First, we are proposing that all eligible employees of the rank of firefighter, engineer, and captain will receive the 3% step pay, which will be effective the first pay period of each fiscal year, which is beginning in July. And uh, to address the concern specifically about the, the time period of that year six through 10, when a Mesa firefighter be, will be making less than a Chandler firefighter, we've agreed that over a two year period, most of it, the, the, we will close that gap, right? We will take those specific employees that we've identified those employees now, We've shared the information with our local union to specifically identify the individuals and the pay that they're getting now and the difference between what they make in, currently in Mesa versus Chandler, for example, and identified that difference. And we will begin to address that beginning in July to close that gap. Again, let me remind you, uh, that same firefighters were making more than a Chandler firefighter for their first three years of their career. And after year 10, or 11 or 12, they will be making more than a Chandler firefighter. We actually, if you look at it over a 15 year period, a Mesa firefighter actually makes more than almost any other firefighter in the Valley. But certainly during years six through 10, uh, we've identified there's a difference. But the cumulative number, even today, a Mesa firefighter makes more. This resolution that we're proposing with the 3% step pay for the next two years 
and reconciling the difference will even further advance uh, Mesa firefighter to be making um, very competitive salary cumulatively versus other firefighters in the Valley. Then what we've also um, suggested that once we have all of those firefighters, if you would say, caught up during that period of time, uh, for the first two years with the Chandler firefighter, what we're proposing is that for years 23, 24, 24, 25, 25 and 26, so the next three years, is that we would include in our five-year forecast the um, assumption to provide a 5% step, step pay increase for, for, the, for the rank of firefighter, engineer, and captain. Uh, that will keep us maintaining that competitiveness so that we don't fall behind, uh, again, for those specific ranks. And again, if you look at it cumulatively, years one through 15, a MESA firefighter will be making as much or more than the average firefighter in the Valley, as that stands today, the information we have today based on the inform survey information we have today. Here's kind of going back into the details of that, how we come to that decision or came to those conclusions, the information that was used. This is information that was provided to both sides between the minimum and the, uh, the minimum salary for different cities uh, that we compare to. You can tell that Mesa is very competitive on the minimum and we're certainly above the average pay. On the maximum salary, again, you see the competitiveness of Mesa as being the highest having the highest maximum range uh, for any city in, um, in the comparative cities um, and certainly well above the current average. And then again, a, another way of looking at this is the average. Uh, Mesa is um, just above the average pay for all firefighters. Um, you can see that um, on this chart here. Um, we also wanted to share with council um, just kind of an overall perspective of the fire department, fire and medical department's adopted budget uh, over the last five years. Uh, five years ago, um, the fire and medical department, along with their capital, had a budget of over just over $77 million. Um, the proposed budget that is before the council today, that budget has increased to almost $131 million. So certainly it's fair to say, and with um, I think we're very um, proud to be able to say that um, the city of Mesa has always prioritized public safety. And I think this chart demonstrates that commitment over uh, a five year period of time. Um, and that, that's included, you know, the assumption of the council approving the budget will have one of the highest budgets we've ever had for the fire department um, ever for the city of Mesa. So that's my presentation, Mayor. If there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer those. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Brady. Um, I'll just kick it off by saying I, 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 I hope that uh, our employees are, are watching this, specifically the fire employees, uh, because I'm, I'm anxious for them to get the message that uh, the city of Mesa values our employees, uh, specifically our public safety employees. We take very seriously our responsibility to be good employers. Uh, we uh, consider our employees a bit to be the city of Mesa. Uh, and so I want them to know that, that, uh, that this is a priority of this council. Uh, we are uh, committed to having fair and competitive salaries and wages for our employees. Uh, and again, that's, I know I speak for everyone on this council when I say that's a priority of, of ours. Uh, it is unfortunate, but I'm glad we have, uh, thank, I appreciate the union uh, bringing to our attention this, this uh, that we fell behind on some of our, our mid-year our mid-tenured firefighters. And I just want to say to them, we will fix this, period. Uh, that's not going to be a problem going forward. Uh, I think Mr. Brady has indicated a willingness on, on uh, the administration, and I know it's, it's supported by this council to, to rectify that. So uh, we're not going to play games. We're, we're just going to fix it. Um, and going forward, I appreciate the fact that uh, we're committed to having larger raises than we have in previous years to make sure that, that, that this situation doesn't reoccur. Uh, and I know Mr. Brady didn't mention it, but part of the, the plan is, is benchmarking it, benchmarking going forward, Mr. Brady, so that every couple of years we will be doing market comparisons uh, with all of our employees, but specifically with, with public safety employees to make sure that we remain competitive. Uh, and that we are, uh, are providing a fair and, and, and competitive salary. 
Um, I just want to also point out that we understand that our public safety personnel, particularly our firefighters, uh, are not, they don't have a normal job. They have extraordinary demands in their profession. We understand that. Uh, and we are grateful for their service, particularly in the context of the last year, uh, as, as we've seen them really uh, rise to the challenge of, of providing exceptional service during the, the pandemic. So uh, I think this is a great start. I think uh, the, I know I speak for Mr. Brady when I say that the, the door remains open uh, as to all of our employees and employee groups, uh, but I appreciate the response uh, that Mr. Brady has, uh, has identified to, to the problem that's been pointed out. Uh, Council, any other comments on this? Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. You know, I appreciate uh, our management for having a candid conversation with our uh, public safety employees because I know it's kind of been tenuous and a little difficult, but they brought forward, as the mayor said, the opportunity to discuss this uh, pay gap, as I call it, for this certain um, uh, certain uh, amount of people here in our organization. So I appreciate uh, what's been said so far, and I'm supportive of this. I, I think it's important to remedy this as fast as possible so that uh, our public safety personnel fire being the first ones that they can know that um, that we're working for them and we appreciate their service so with that thank you mayor thank you mr freeman uh, yes frankie what's the uh, what's the average of a firefighter tenure do most last like mr freeman here our colleague <laughs> uh yeah what was it 30 years or? Well, I would imagine most of our firefighters continue till they retire, yeah. To retire. So I don't know what that number, is that what you're asking is? Yeah, how, yeah. like how, how long do, uh, an av like the average tenure of a firefighter? Yeah, we don't have a lot of attrition in firefighters and, and they until stay they get to about to 20 years or so, years then, yeah, then they're eligible for retirement, so. I might just say about 25 oh, to 30 years. The drop and everything. Yeah, okay. so yeah. And there's some new implementation that you cannot retire before 25 years of service for new hires. Okay. All right. So, and to that point, <laughs> Councilman Heredia, I think that's why we've always made the point that by having the highest maximum, our firefighters can earn more after about 10 years and certainly well and, and then above that for a, a long period of time that they're earning the highest salary in the Valley. And then what, not only does that help them during the time that they're working for the city of Mesa, but also is important because that's how their pension numbers are determined. And so as you look at slide six, right now, our firefighters are in a very strong position to earn as much or more than most of the other cities in the Valley, but also that continues to provide a benefit to them in the calculation of their pension, obviously, and that continues long after they stay with the city. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I also really appreciate this. Thank you. I think it's important to come up with a solution. Um, so just for my mind, does this mean that our firefighters will max out earlier than if we increase the pay during those six to 10 years, we, they'll max earlier than they would have? It just means they'll move up to the top possibly sooner than normally, but that's what's happening. You can tell in a lot of these other cities, that's kind of a philosophy that they move closer to their max. Um, earlier, earlier, uh, within fewer years. Uh, over the last five or six years, and I think the uh, local union brought this up, our, because of fiscal constraints for the city, all employees have been constrained to having maybe three and 4% uh, pay increases. And I think while other public safety personnel in other cities have seen the 5% increases, that's what's created the difference. And so what we're trying to do is, is um, reconcile that difference, but at the same record time recognizing we kind of get a head start because we start out higher and then we also finish stronger because our employees make more. But we're gonna fix that part in the middle. And then I think that's why we wanted to add on to the fiscal years out into the future that commitment, which has always been important about this idea of being competitive on the annual increase. And that's why you see the last three years at 5%. That seems to be the norm. And I think what we're making is a strong commitment to make that commitment now for those last three years. Okay. And then another question, do, do all cities have just similar benefits and do benefits ever come into play with how much people make or how much, is that just- Absolutely they do and, they are, and they're, they're similar but not. I mean, they can be, they, every city determines their own package of benefits and 
deductibles and premiums and availability. Um, and that's where it's really difficult. And then you have to look in specifically in the fire department, I'll let Mr. Freeman speak to this, there's all kinds of certifications you can receive, there's opportunities for overtime, so there's a lot of other, beyond this component piece of salary, there's a lot of other um, variables that allow a, a firefighter or any rank in the, in the department to um, earn additional dollars. But none of that comes into play on a chart like this. This is The only thing, this becomes the base by which some of those are calculated okay. as percentages okay. or, or, or to that point, yes. <laughs> Mayor, I just wondered if you if you needed a motion or just an acknowledgement to move forward with this uh, plan. Well, uh, Mr. Smith, I believe because this is adding some uh, additional direction to staff for our, our, our budget, that it would be appropriate for us to make a motion and, and direct staff uh, to to make these in, in, uh, additional budget allocations to address uh, firefighter compensation. So. Is that correct, Mr. Smith? Yeah, and it's specifically for this next fiscal year, a motion to include the staff recommendations for this next fiscal year. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor. Um, before we take that vote, I just wanted to ask to make sure that we're at a satisfactory position with the fire union on this. So we take a motion and I don't, you know, want the... Well, I, you know, Mayor, I, Vice I Mayor, I think the best are. way to answer that question is, um, and I want to be very clear, and not say something that goes beyond a week ago in my office, I reached an agreement with the local firefighter union president and this is where the deal points and we've shared those deal points with them. Um, so his, what I heard from him is that this was a reasonable fair deal and he felt good about it. Um, we do not have, I can't represent that the organization itself has given mm -hmm. us concurrence but I would say to the mayor and council is, we feel very strongly this is a very good proposal. And because um, we've tried to address all the concerns that have been raised to us since January, I think it would be helpful for us. And I think the mayor said it is. Um, at the end of the day, these are our employees. They work for the city of Mesa. They work for this city council. So we make the decisions and policies of how to address compensation and I think we've done a very good job of trying to listen to the local fire union the concern about those in that six to ten year period I think you can see otherwise we're very competitive on starting salaries maximum salaries average salaries and so we think this is a very fair package and I think once we say once we kind of get caught up what we're also committing to that has never been done since I've been here is committing a long-term proposal to do a 5% increase for three years on the backside of this five-year deal. So we would recommend to the council, we would like to put this forward because we think it's important for our employees to receive this, these benefits. I, I too think it's you know a very fair and I appreciate all your um, work with the FIRE employees and, and making this recommendation and I do approve it. Um, I just wanted to know if we were at the, hopefully the, the end of that. <laughs> uh, I do, um, approve going forward with this. I think it is something that um, is very fair and um, hopefully uh, all the um, firefighters and the staff around that, we appreciate them and um, I appreciate the work of all our staff here in the city management and uh, the fire union in, in working this out. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And I'll, I'll just underscore what Mr. Brady said as well. I think we, I, I want people to know that we accept responsibility for the compensation for our firefighters. We, we, we consider this our duty to make sure that, that those folks who work so hard for us are fairly and competitively uh, compensated. And so uh, the door remains open. We will always in good faith talk with, with any employee group or, in, you know, or group of or individual employees uh, and, and hear their concerns and, and in a good faith way uh, continue to address them so this is not a <clears throat> we're slamming the door shut this is uh, we're gonna the door will always remain open to talking with our yeah, and mayor thank you for saying that and as everyone knows uh, mr. Pombier who leads these conversations and has done it for years is always open to having conversations on this or any other matter regarding fire personnel and so I want to you know John's been working on us for a long time and um, I think it's very easy to get hold of him even on his days off, as he told me. So, <laughs> thank you, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to add one more comment. Um, 
I know as council, you know, we are not over the employees and we just approve the budget and stuff like that. But um, in fairness to all the employees of the city of the Mesa that we look at um, where they are in their subsets. You know, we went through a recession. There was a lot of cutbacks. I don't know if we're caught up, but to look at all employees and, and their pay ranges and step and all that to make sure we're fair to the <clears throat> entire city. Ma Mayor, Vice Mayor, I really do appreciate you saying that because sometimes there's some very loud voices that only get heard, but we know there's lots of employees out there um, that every day are doing a great work and making a big difference in our community. And we're sensitive to that, just as we do for public safety. Every two years we do a, a review of the benchmarking of, of positions throughout the city. Um, and so we're looking at any opportunity we can do. To, we want to be competitive um, in, in those areas also. So we will keep, we'll be mindful of that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council. Any, any other comments? Mr. Luna? Mayor? Yes, Mr. Luna. Mayor? Thank you. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chris Brady, for work. Sorry about my signal. I don't know if you're hearing me or not. But I, I do want to thank uh, Chris Brady and the team, as well as Dale Krogan, because he's been he's been working really hard to uh, come up with this deal. And and I appreciate the the deal came through last week. And uh, but I also I want to thank the the fire union. Sometimes we don't. There's uh, there's situations where there's not always an agreement. But I think uh, this has been. This effort has resulted into something that's been very positive, something that they wanted. So, uh, so thank you, Del Krogan, for leading that team, and uh, thank you, City of Mesa, uh, for working hard, and thank you for our fire firefighters who work so hard to protect to protect us. So, thank you. I will be supporting this. Thank you, Mr. Luna. All right, Council. Any other discussion on this item? If not, is there a motion to include the staff recommendation for the 2021 budget motion? A budget motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Freeman, seconded by the Vice Mayor. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Are there any opposed? Thank you. That, that passes uh, unanimously. The next item on our agenda for this meeting is to acknowledge uh, board minutes. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Ms. Billsbury, seconded by Mr. Freeman. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Are there any opposed? Thank you. That motion passes unanimously as well. Next item on our agenda is, and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Freeman, we, we, you're excused. I know you have an appointment to get to. Uh, the next item is current event summary, including meetings and conferences attended. I, Council, I know you've been very busy. I've seen you out and about. Who would like to start? Mr. Uh, Thompson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, last Friday, I believe it was, my, my days run together uh, nowadays. Um, yourself and Councilmember Freeman and I were at the Infinite Movement, um, Arizona Defense and Space Technology Expo out at our very own AZ Labs at Gateway Airport. Uh, I wanted to thank Kelly Keffer with Economic Development and their entire team for putting that together. I think it was a huge success and it really highlighted um, our, our AZ Labs out there and, and hopefully we can have more programming like that moving forward um, that puts um, Em em emphasis on some of the um, some of the the opportunities that that we have in the city for for others. Um, and this past uh, Tuesday, you and I uh, broke ground on Electromechanica in District Six, uh, which is only one of three in the entire state of Arizona electric uh, vehicle manufacturers and their research and development as well as their manufacturing piece is gonna be uh, right here in Arizona, in Mesa, Arizona for their solo uh, vehicle. Uh, so very exciting, not only for Mesa, but for District 6 and the region as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Those both were, were, were great events. Uh, it is fun to see Mesa, Arizona in the discussion, the national, the, the, or really the global conversation about electric vehicles. Uh, uh, so uh, that's, that's a great fit for uh, the, the high-tech manufacturing that we're, we're, we're trying to uh, encourage out in, in, in and around the Gateway Airport area. Uh, Vice Mayor. Yes, uh, last Thursday I attended the We Run Mesa Youth Running Program at Eagles Park and we handed out medals to the kids who concluded the program with um, Mesa uh, Fire Chief Mary Camelli and the Police Chief uh, Ken Cost was there, the Mesa Parks uh, Director Andrea Moore was there, and many uh, 
um, personnel from the Mesa Police Department, so I want to thank all of them for really encouraging these youth and showing them how special they are. This program empowers youth and teaches them you know, healthy practices, not only physically, but mentally. Um, also, on last Thursday, I attended the Visit Mesa's Power of Travel Partner Networking event at the Revelry. Um, with Councilmember Freeman and Councilmember Spilsbury. We had great fun, and uh, the, it's the first time I was at the Revelry. I recommend for everybody to check it out. It's a fun place with lots of games, music, a great place to hang out. Um, and uh, for everybody out there, um, Mesa has a lot to explore. I'm always finding new places, uh, new things to do, and I'm lifetime here. I'm listening to the podcast the mayor has and learning a lot more. It's always cool in Mesa. Uh, so thank you and, and enjoy the city. Thank you. If that prompts, you know, I can't let that go without uh, <laughs> plugging. It's always cool in Mesa. Please go to your, to your app store or to your podcast store. We just dropped a new episode yesterday, so there's a total of four. Uh, there'll be, uh, we'll continue to do that for the next couple of weeks. But there's some really interesting stories about interesting things in Mesa. I encourage people to, to listen. Ms. Spielsbury. Um, I know the vaccine pods have been mentioned several times, but my assistant Melissa and I were able to go um, volunteer yesterday, and I'm just so impressed with the incredible organization that happens there. It's a well-oiled machine, and it's just neat to see so many people come in and get vaccinated and get treated well and then and leave. And um, So Christy and Michelle, obviously Mary, all of the great people down there that are doing excellent work. That was a fun experience. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Can I take a moment to put a little plug for this uh, City of Mesa Renewable Energy Service Rider Program? So if you're a City of Mesa electric customer, you can sign up for this program in which all your electric will be from renewable uh, sources. It's, there's a, a slight cost. You can choose at what degree you want to absorb the extra cost. And uh, I think I calculated for myself it's going to be like an extra $10 a month, but I did the maximum. But every little bit helps for anybody who is um, climate conscious, uh, what you can do to help your city purchase more renewable energy for our electric. Thank you. That's good to know. I'm sure there's a lot of folks that will take advantage of that. Uh, other comments, Councilor? Yes, Mr. Luna. Uh, yesterday I attended the National League of Cities Constituency Group President's Meeting. Uh, we discussed constituency group policy recommendations as it relates to municipalities and prepare for the constituency group conference, which will be held this summer. I'm looking forward to working and continue to work with my fellow with constituency group presidents to advance equ equality and inclusion policies throughout the country. Thank you, Mr. Luna, for your leadership there. We appreciate it. Other comments, Council? Uh, I'll just note that, that uh, I had last week the graduation for the Mayor's Youth Committee, uh, and I encourage uh, high school juniors and seniors uh, to, to please uh, talk with your counselors and, and, and your school administrators and, and uh, see if you can be on the Mayor's Youth Committee next year. Uh, it's, a, it's always a wonderful group of young people, and they are very, very sharp. Uh, I know uh, we've had some of the council members have joined me in, in hearing their presentations, and. And every year they come up with some ideas uh, that we end up incorporating into the way that the Mesa City government operates. So uh, it was uh, uh, sad that we didn't get to, to work uh, in person a lot this year because of COVID, but nonetheless, I was glad we could have a graduation ceremony with them last week. Uh, also, uh, I'll note that I've been involved in a lot of discussions over the last week with Greater Phoenix leadership and uh, various industry leaders talking about the extension of Proposition 400 uh, and, and regional transportation st strategies. I have the, uh, the opportunity to be the incoming chairman of MAG beginning in July. Uh, that coincides with the, the efforts to uh, get the Prop 400 extension on the ballot. So that's something that, that I'm glad that Mesa will be uh, in the middle of here for the next year, uh, year and a half or so. Uh, that, that'll be a good opportunity for all of us to, to have some, some influence in that very important campaign. Uh, if there's nothing else, Mr. Brady, what does our schedule of future meetings look like? Mayor, we don't have any uh, items pr as far as the study session prior to the council meeting on Monday as far as budget items. So we'll just see you at our regular Monday time, which will be 515 on Monday. Great. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? 
Thank you, Ms. Pillsbury and Mr. Reddy. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>